Hey, welcome back, everybody. Today we have Wayne Slight of 97th Floor. It sounds like an elevator or something, Wayne. Why don't you give the audience a background, tell them what you do. I think we're going to have a good conversation here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, 97th Floor, we're, we're a marketing agency. Uh, people always ask where, where the name comes from, which that of itself proves it's a good name, right? Everyone's always asking about it. It's kind of hard to forget. And the, the story, we always try to come up with, you know, better stories because it's a very boring story. Our, our founder and CEO is kind of one of those two in the morning with his wife. They're applying for the business license and this is 2005 and just needed a name. Uh, so they came up with it. There's a little bit more meaning of, you know, taking our clients to the, you know, highest floor in the building, you know, growing their business. We started out specifically doing SEO search engine optimization. So there's a little bit of play in terms of like climbing the rankings um, there. Uh, but yeah, so we're, we're a marketing agency uh, in headquartered in Utah, in Lehigh, Utah, which is just, just south of Salt Lake City um, with a satellite office in, in San Francisco. And the four areas that we uh, kind of specialize in, and each one of those is you know pretty complex, but it's SEO, paid media, marketing automation, and, and content marketing. Um, and yeah, we've been in business uh, for, yeah, we just celebrated our 14 year anniversary uh, in September. And we're about, I think we have 96 um, team members uh, across the two locations, majority here in Utah. Wow, 96, that's, that's great. And uh, are the majority of those millennials? Yes, the last time I pulled the average age, we were 28. And we have had a few older, so maybe now we're 29 or something, but yeah, we're pretty uh, <laughs> millennial. Which I didn't I, even I'd never qualify. Out. I'd ruin your averages, you know, <laughs> being 62. I'd totally it'd just ruin everything. Just right. one guy messes the whole thing up. That's great. Well, I didn't even know. I, I thought millennial for, you know, years until about two years ago, I found out. I, w I thought millennials were like the teenagers, but I found out that's Gen uh, Z, right? Gen um, Z, yeah. That's that's right. Millennials, I think it's 1980. So, yeah, we have quite a bit. I think, I think we probably have four maybe employees or team members that are not millennials, but everyone else is millennials or I guess even some Gen Z's now possibly. So you guys must have some really information, some tips, tactics, whatever, as far as engaging millennials. But before we go there, I'm really curious on the marketing agency, the marketing business type of thing. And, and forgive me, uh, but I, I don't actually today, I know marketing people that I like, and, but I don't have anybody I recommend because I don't know anybody who, you know, is, is consistently successful at sitting down and kind of mapping out a plan or whatever you want to do, or, you know, reaching into the hat and pulling out the rabbit, whatever you do. Uh, people can spend money on marketing, just like, you know, tossing money away, burning money type of thing, mm -hmm. if they're not careful. So what do you guys do that's different that really provides a great ROI on the marketing? I'm, I'm personally curious. Yeah. So when you say you don't have anyone good that you'd recommend, are you talking about agencies or just even like if someone was going to be a CMO at a company or a VP of marketing or something like that, you're against I mean, that. I mean like outside talent. So, so outside. hired contract talent, you, whether it's an agency, an individual, whatever. I mean, some people are just like in the SEO niche. Some of the people, I mean, we have, we have a client right now that wants to, um, wants branding help and mm -hmm. take the branding across everything he does. And then also wants the SEO, but he also has content that's kind of unique because he's an IT managed service provider. So yeah. he's got, you know, he's got a site right now where he does get leads and he gets that content done for him. Mm -hmm. But the other pieces that he wants, um, they don't, you know, they don't do that. And he doesn't, you know, he's trying to find a one-stop shop, but maybe I said to him the other day, I said, well, maybe you need to think of two, you know, that piece is done and you, you tack and you bolt on the other one. I, I don't know, but yeah. My main question is just, it's so easy to waste money in marketing. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys really score with so many, you know, your clients, you got some great testimonials on your website. I actually want to ask you about a few of them, but how would you respond to that question? Yeah. So I think what most people, and that's why I kind of asked you the, the question back when, when most people are talking about uh, marketing people, I think we should, distinguish outside help, like an agency, like 90 cent floor versus in, in-house help. And I actually think majority of cases that I've come across and I've been in this for 11 years now where it comes into problems is people use an agency 
for stuff that they should own in house. Um, so the agencies, and I'm sure there's good agencies out there that do everything and they have some, you know, uh, good case studies for that. But in the majority of the cases, I think the core marketing for a brand, for a company, that should be handled in house. That should be an internal hire. You should not rely on an agency for everything. Um, I think an agency should be more of a, I've already, I have someone in house owning the, the overall strategy for whatever the case may be. So if we're talking uh, SEO, like I have someone that's handling our overall marketing and we know SEO is at play and I'm gonna be, you know, handling the overall strategy of what I want to accomplish. And then I'm going to bring an agency in that is more specialized and I can hold them accountable to whatever results I want to see. That's when I see it, it typically, you know, now it comes down to, you know, the talent and, and whatnot there, but that's a lot, a lot better than just outsourcing marketing completely. And oftentimes that's smaller businesses. So I'm not sure exactly what, um, uh, you know, cases you're specifically talking about, but I think sometimes smaller companies, let's go to over to paid ads, right? Like maybe they're spending like $3,000, $4,000 a month in on Facebook ads and they want to go use an agency that's charging them a thousand dollars. So then, you know, 4,000 ads spend a thousand dollars to an agency. Now you're 5,000 in most times it's probably better just to have the internal team or just the CEO of the company or whatever, you know, whoever's doing it, just use that $5,000 in ad spend instead of going out to, uh, you know, spending that thousand dollars on an agent agency, use that more in Facebook ads. I think so, you have to kind of reach a scale where it actually matters. Yeah. So give me a little more detail on uh, what are the core things that you think should be in house? Anything that it is. So if like marketing is very, very fundamental to a business, I think everything should be in house. Now that's not to say you don't use an eight. I and mean, we have, you know, a lot of our enterprise clients have marketing teams of hundreds of people and they still use us and many other agencies. Um, there's cases for those when, you know, an agency is something where you can hire up really quick to get a project done in a quarter where if you're going to hire an internal team, it's a little bit slower of a process. If you're, testing something out or if it's just like a you know a, a quarter push or something like that you, if you hire an internal team it's kind of hard to cut that off so there's cases for that but on like a little bit of the smaller business uh or mid, mid, medium-sized businesses where the marketing team's not built out i think you can outsource a lot more of it but it has to be uh typically at a scale well i think you can outsource to an agency to test the water so if you've never done you know again, I'll just use Facebook ads. If you've never done Facebook ads, I think that's okay to outsource to an agency just to get some data to see if it's even a viable channel for your business, right? And then if so, it is- so, so stay there for a moment. So you, you're saying outsource to an agency, never done Facebook ads before. So if, if I've never done it and I want to accomplish something, let's say I have 100 or less employees, kind of like your size. Mm -hmm. um, and so what should I plan to spend for a test that one month test, three months test, six months, 12 months. And what should I be spending each month to kind of test to uh, until I can get to the point of finding out what works? Yeah. Uh, the terrible answer of it. It depends. It, it does depend. If your sales cycle is, you know, our sales cycle typically, I mean, sometimes we can, it's, you know, someone contacts us and within a month, you know, the next month we're working, but typically it's, you know, drawn out. It's a maybe three month cycle on average. So in those cases, yeah, I'd, I'd probably uh, try to do your Facebook, whatever paid channel. So if you're doing Facebook ads, I would draw it out a lot longer. If you're selling like a very uh, product that is you know, somewhat inexpensive, I, you know, you can have your tests be, you know, a lot smaller um, time frame. In terms of how much money you should spend, again, it, the reason it depends is sometimes you can get a, you know, you can sell your item at twenty dollars, you know, uh, average, you know, cost cost per acquisition essentially. If that's the case, your total ad spend can be a little bit less than you know something that's uh, a high priced cost per acquisition. There. Okay. Well, I don't know whether you're comfortable with this, but I'll give you some details. And this is not a quote anybody in the audience is allowed to hold you to. But yeah. if you can give a ballpark. Yeah. So let's say I've got uh, 30 people in my organization. Let's say I sell some type of service. 
let's say the service is a minimum of $1,000 a month, it can go as high as $20,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And I've never done Facebook ads before. I have a website. I mean, I'm not total neophyte. Mm -hmm. But um, what's the type of thing I should be looking to to come up with? I, are you guys going to help with the messaging? And I would assume a lot of reasons there's, you know, you're in business because you got some great idea people. So what's, what's my test? What's the type of range I'm going to look at for a test like that? Um, so I, I think with that, you can, one, you can rely a little bit on, uh, your industry and, you know, you can see your competitor, like if you're a, if it's a B2B service, you know, maybe LinkedIn is a little bit more. So, so there's some stuff you don't have to just throw money at to, to test the waters. You can do some research and competitive analysis and see what your competitors that are maybe bigger than you, or you're trying to target what they're doing. There's a lot of free tools, but you know, really good paid tools to help you out with that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, in, t in terms of how much money you should spend, it's, it's hard to throw an exact number. It's kind of like whatever number you want, just make sure you have the analytics set up to test it, right? That's the like, biggest thing with marketing when you're, if you've never done anything before and you don't have any data to analyze yet, is people th start throwing money. They hire an agency or they throw money at Facebook ads or LinkedIn or whatever the case may be. And they go off kind of off of gut of, well, did I get more sales? But they don't have the actual, you know, uh, system in place to analyze if this was a smart investment. So once you have that done and then you start throwing the money at whatever, 5,000, kind of whatever's in the budget, but at, at least it's reasonable to get, you know, good enough data that you can actually start seeing if it's going to uh, be a positive ROI. Then you start doubling down. And then once you get to a scale, then yeah, you, you can go out to an agency or you can hire in-house someone. I, I would just, I wouldn't hire in-house until I know that's going to be for sure. Like it's a viable channel and now I'm just trying to optimize it. You don't want to hire in-house okay. and it's like, so, oh, test so, it out for a month. So let me get some people, let me get some people inspired here or dreaming. So you had some interesting testimonials, case studies, whatever you want to call them, mentions on your website of some different companies. So let me, let me throw out three of them and, and tell me what happened there and, why what you guys did what had such a big impact so you had one with oc tanner that sounded like it had some mm -hmm. huge impact wasn't it like six million views or something like that yeah i'm not sure the exact numbers but yeah so so what good. exactly did you do with those guys yeah so they came we did a lot that the case study that i'm assuming is on the website is more in terms of one campaign over a bigger picture of what they hired us for to do their main thing when they came to us um, was SEO they wanted to increase their rankings in the search engines which would therefore increase the organic traffic that's the idea and organic traffic converted at a, a pretty high rate um, anyway so we were doing a lot of the traditional uh, stuff that we were doing but we came up with a campaign if you know SEO one of the important themes with SEO is getting other websites to link to you like really authoritative websites that are linking to your site. Anyway, so we came up with this uh, content marketing campaign, which was the uh, coolest companies to work for campaign. So OC Tanner is an HR, in the HR space, they do like employee recognition programs uh, for companies. Anyway, yeah. so we did this campaign. It started out pretty darn basic. Um, I remember I was actually on the work, this is uh, several years ago, and uh, we just came up with different cities and we would, I, I would do the research on my own, like Glassdoor and different things like that. And we'd highlight 10 companies in Philadelphia that were the coolest companies to work for, right? Um, we would start getting those companies. We'd reach out to those companies to have them participate in it, you know, give us some stats on their companies, what kind of perks they're doing, what's their culture like, you know, et cetera. And we would highlight those 10 companies. The beautiful thing is it would rank anytime you typed in, uh, you know, if you typed in like, cool companies to work for in Philadelphia, we were ranking number one, you know, at the time for that. It wasn't a high search volume, but that is actually in similar searches to that, right? Like a great company to work for in Philadelphia. So we were seeing a lot of traffic from that. Um, probably not the most qualified traffic though. You know, someone that's searching for a job in Philadelphia isn't gonna, you know, high, you know spend a million dollars with OC Tanner to build out an employee recognition program. Um, but the, what we did it for mainly 
was these companies then when they're recognized, they were linking back to, you know, hey, they put on their blog post, they post on social media, so you're sending social signals to OC Tanner's site, we got featured. And that's an SEO benefit, right? So now OC Tanner, when you search employee recognition program in Google, which is a very targeted, you know, keyword, whoever's searching for that, that's typically HR directors, VP of people, whatever, um, we were ranking higher. So we were able to prove to them like, you know, before this campaign, I can't remember the exact locations and percentages or, or traffic increases or whatnot, but there was visible, you know, we, we're starting to rank higher now for these keywords, the organic traffic from Google to those pages, not the blog posts that we highlighted, but those like product pages, if you will, the main landing pages, those are now starting to get X amount of more traffic. Um, anyway, so the campaign, started out like that. It was monthly and it just got better and better. We actually partner, ended up partnering with um, great, pla uh, great Places to Work, I believe is the organization. Yeah, yeah, I think it is, yeah. Fortune uh, uses them for their, um, you know, top companies uh, to work for list too. So we partnered with them. So they started providing the data so it wasn't, you know, Wayne and other people at 90 Cent Floors, our, our opinion. Um, we actually had a, a submission so companies could start applying uh, uh, to be a part of this award uh, so it turned out to be a lot uh, bigger but the seo benefit was huge huge for them uh, and that was the main thing but there's always other benefits too one one i can't remember what see i think it might be philadelphia and that's why i'm throwing it out there we they actually got one lead specifically from that campaign when they came into the cycle and they started talking to a salesperson they mentioned oh yeah i found i heard about 90 or uh, oc tanner because of the, the this coolest company uh page in the city Anyway, and, and again, their deal sizes are million dollar, you know, they're doing employee recognition programs for Amex and, you know, huge organizations like that. Um, yeah, they do big was, stuff. So and it's, it's interesting that your approach was actually kind of a side door because it wasn't, you know, uh, buy recognition programs, you know, or sign up for our service or buy all our tchotchkes we got type of thing. It was by connecting them to the ultimate output that you want to be a cool company. I mean, that's kind of why people do the, the recognition programs. So yeah, it was kind of, it was interesting and, and strategic. Put LC Tanner a little bit into that branding. You know, when you think cool companies, well, OC Tanner's, uh, you know, the organization that is the authority on, on telling, you know, who's the cool companies to work for, you're kind of associating LC Tanner with, you know, they're the experts. So, Whatever they say about employee recognition programs, you know, they, they probably know what they're talking about. Well, that's interesting. Well, let me flip it now because you take OC Tanner and everybody feels good and there's lots of smiles. Now, let's talk about guns. Let's talk about uh, you know, nine millimeter ammo mm. was one of your other ones on there that looked like it had some pretty interesting results. Yeah, that one I'm not as familiar with. I, I didn't personally ever work on that one. Um, I believe that the case study on our website is, uh, it was like a creative piece um, that it was instead of talking all about all day about uh i think they only sold ammunition i don't believe they sold um guns nine millimeter ammo that, that yeah i think you're um, correct um instead of always just talking about that they tried we, we thought it'd be fun to have a little bit more of a creative play so um i think they did walking dead which again is a show i've never watched either so i'm not the most qualified to uh uh talk on this campaign but yeah it was it was like a a, a fun infographic uh about um, I think it was just like different weapons that they would use in, in the TV show, Walking Dead to kill zombies or something like that. Um, so it was a little bit more, but again, that was an, S, that was an SEO play as well. Um, it's getting, cause you want other websites and, you know, people sharing your content on social that signals to the search engines that the content that you have is and your website overall is worthy of showing to users on these search engines. So I think that got a lot of social signals and a lot of links um, from third party sites coming into nine millimeter ammo's website. So then when people are online searching for ammunition for whatever gun they own, I don't I don't know anything about guns, um, they'll rank higher for those terms. Yeah, well, it was pretty amazing. I mean, um, it's 220,000 person spike in site visitors within two days, 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And a 2,273 percent referral traffic, a jump, and it, it's a pretty generic name. I mean, nine millimeter ammo. You'd you'd enter that in. You probably got all kinds of search results on yeah. where you can buy ammo. 
So but now that's actually something though, back to kind of your first question of uh, is it ROI, is that gonna, you know, people that find and, you know, are sharing this fun creative piece, is that actually gonna turn into sales? No, most people are probably just thinking, oh, this is a, a funny thing or interesting thing about whatever show I like. Um, and that's not the point we, we, I mean, it's, it's a benefit having more traffic, more eyeballs. It could help with branding, especially if you're a little bit more of a, a brand as opposed to nine millimeter ammo that can help. Um, but the true benefit in that case was the, the SEO benefit when we started ranking higher for targeted keywords and those were landing pages, you know, their product pages of their ammunition. When you start ranking higher for that, when people type it in and you start seeing more traffic directly from uh, organic traffic, Google organic traffic, as opposed to just like, you know, Twitter traffic to that blog post with that creative piece of content. Now that's where the real value is and that's where they're actually making sales. So you definitely, whatever you're doing with marketing, you need to make sure that it's coming back to ROI, whether it's sales or leads or, you know, depending on your business, what metrics you use. Interesting. Okay. So let me just ask you one more on the, on the blend tech one. Hmm. So this, this will it blend campaign, did you guys come up with that? No, the will it blend campaign that that's a, that was um, Tom. Uh, I think his last name is uh, Dickinson. I should know. I've, I've met him a few times. Um, he's the founder of, of uh, blend tech. I think he's still the CEO. Um, maybe not. Uh, that's how blend tech became famous. Like I think in the uh, mid nineties, um, he would start doing these videos where he would blend golf balls and you know whatever the case may be, right? Uh, I think this was even before YouTube, but probably when YouTube first came about too, like they, they were big there. Um, so this is way before 97th Floor came, right? So they had yeah. this big viral push and that's what everyone knew them from, which is great, but it's kind of hard to, you know, keep going for 15, 20 years. So we tried to have a, a campaign that was, uh, it wasn't naturally going to be as viral as that, but it was a little bit more useful because, you know, that, that is a very useful thing. You blend golf balls up and if it can smash a, you know, a golf ball up, then it's probably going to be able to smash my frozen strawberries up for my smoothie or whatever it may be. <laughs> so we created, uh, the, a campaign. It was, it was a recipe, uh, campaign and how we found that again, this was a more of a SEO play too. So all, all these ones that we're talking about is the one of our, you know, four kind of services, but um, we found through our, our research or, you know, uh, keyword analysis research that people on the internet were searching very heavily for different types of recipes online. Very, you know, I think most people would kind of agree with, but at least we, we got the data to back that up. Um, so we started creating content about recipes, pretty darn basic, but all these recipes were ha using a blender with it, right? So if you become now kind of a thought leader, if you will, when people are searching for different types of recipes online and it's blend tech that keeps coming up and all their recipes involve a blender, well, who, what, when, when they need a blender, who do you think they're gonna choose? Blend tech or Vitamix or whatever other brand? That was kind of the, the point of it. Um, so one of the big ones I think on our site is Buffalo Wild Wings like there was no content out there but people were searching for uh recipes to create the different sauces at buffalo wild wings uh so we we did research and we got the different recipes and and uh uh yeah we built that one i think we built like just an infographic it was interesting different infographic but other ones we do videos um we we hire our video team to you know shoot different videos for these recipes um but yeah that's that was the the blend tech campaign Okay, so let me let me shift gears here. So I'm really curious. You got 97 people in your company. The average age is 28 or 29. Uh, people who go to college usually get her out around 22 or 23. And you got 97 marketing experts, quote unquote, off your website. So if you were to talk to a company and tell them, hey, we are millennials. We know how to manage millennials. We know how to build a thriving culture with millennials. What are like the top things that you would tell them what would you advise them to do to have a great workplace and get the most out of millennials as employees correct employees in general i would tell them to stop reading i feel like the 2019 we're starting to get a little bit better but the last three years and probably before that stop reading all those articles about how 
weird and different millennials are. Um, actually, uh, just a couple months ago, I spoke at a, a conference um, on this topic. And when you really actually look into the studies about this kind of stuff, instead of just, you know, Joe Schmo's opinion on whatever website writing about millennials of just his, you know, personal experience with one millennial, um, all the studies show that there is no generational differences in the workplace. There are generational differences um, outside of the workplace, but those actually typically aren't even generational um, differences. It's more just stages in life, right? Most people in their 20s don't have children. Most people in their 40s have children. So it's, it's not so much a generational difference, just an yeah. age gap difference. Anyway, but so what I've, I noticed, and actually the company I worked at before, 97th Floor, they, they had great intentions, but I think they had it backwards too, where they were trying to um, attract and retain and get the most out of a younger workforce. So they did the whole ping pong, you know, thing. I think every day we had two different um, scheduled times that like my you know, team that we sat next to, we got to go in and, and play ping pong and stuff. And I think it was like they mandatory. Talk, they forced you to play ping pong. It's just like, you know, yeah. it's like something to complain about to the employment government people that, you know, abuse, they're forcing me to play ping pong twice a day. Yeah. The one, no, the, the abuse one was, I think, I think if you did your first sale, I was on the, uh, the sales team there, you would have to ride around in the office in like some weird bicycle, you know, loud color, and people would shoot you with Nerf guns. I kid you not. That, that one was, that one was probably the mandatory one. Um, anyway, great, great people and stuff. But I think what they lost sight on was even when you're a 22 year old person, it's not only for the 40, 50, 60 year olds, like you want meaningful work you want to do something that you feel is actually making an impact in this world. It doesn't have to necessarily be you're curing cancer, but like at 97th floor, we're not curing cancer. Um, we donate 1% of our uh, gross revenue to charities. Like, you know, lots of these places are actually making crazy impactful work, uh, themes, but us helping nine millimeter ammo out and help them grow, you know, they're service servicing, you know, whatever needs and they can grow and, you know, hire two more people. How's that not making an impact? you know, in, in the world. Um, anyway, so it doesn't have to be like life altering stuff, but it, the company needs to focus in on, you know, something that is providing their employees meaning and purpose. And instead of trying to fill that hole in people's hearts with just fun stuff, that probably lasts for a little bit, but after a while, that hole is still in their heart or their soul, whatever you want to uh, say and I think sometimes and they're gonna eventually leave or you're gonna retain people that are fine with just having a lot of fun little perks and um, whatnot but those are probably the wrong people long term for your organization so I'm not yeah. against perks and fun I think a lot of people think I am because uh, I've written a lot about this kind of stuff um, and we will never have a ping pong office at 90 cent floor just <laughs> what it represents I actually love ping pong well, I like it um, but would, we just won't do it for what it represents. But we have a lot of fun stuff. Um, pretty much every month we, we do like a fun activity, go skiing as a company, go tubing, moving. Like we do that stuff, but we don't really talk about it, especially in our job ads, especially in our interviews. because so we don't want people that are attracted to a company because, wow, it's providing me fun. Come on, you, you got your own personal life. You got your friends, you got your family. Like that should be your fun life. Your work should be meaningful work, something that's challenging you, something where you feel like you're growing in your passion or you know, whatever field you're in, because I assume that's why you chose that field because you're excited about it, you're interested in it. Um, so that's the stuff that we focus in on when we're hiring or putting up job ads is, is the work and that you're gonna be challenged here, you're gonna uh, be pushed to grow and there's gonna be opportunities for you to grow in that, take on more responsibilities, Obviously, pay is an you know, important factor. So quick question. You do these activities once a month. Are they during work hours or are they outside of work hours? And so they're optional. So we don't have um, work hours, but typically we try to, like those type of things we would typically do outside. So of was that the trade-off? It's like, we're not going to have ping pong, but we're not going to have work hours anyway. But you guys can all be employees. <laughs> it's like, it's, a, it's not a problem. Yeah. So we, we do a thing. We didn't invent it. Row results only work environment. It was invented by... Uh, uh, two women, um, 
uh, Callie and she, I can't remember the, the, the woman's name. They were at Best Buy like 15 years ago and they started at Best Buy and they, they spun off and created their own organization where they train on this. And so we're certified in, in their organization. Anyway, so it's not something we own, but um, the name is results only, right? Results only work environment. So we give each team and then therefore every team member has specific results that they need to accomplish. Um, oftentimes we, we try as much as we can to have uh, measurable and like objective um, results as opposed to subjective. But you know, sometimes there's some hard things there where sometimes it's a little subjective. But, so we don't care about um, time. We don't talk about time. Um, granted, we're a service-based company, so we're working with um, clients. So you know, if they have to be meeting with a client, typically it's going to be in the eight to five, Monday through Friday um, type thing. But anyway, yeah, these, these activities are, uh, we try most likely to get those outside of traditional work hours. Okay, you know, so, so I'm curious now, a um, couple questions here. First of all, we, we do the same thing. I've found the same thing over my career, that the number one thing I believe is meaningful work to connect people. So really critical to any company culture, you wanna have everybody engaged, you gotta have everybody have kind of a similar belief in what is meaningful work. But have you also found that there's individual nuances to that with each employee that you kind of got to connect with because each person goes about fulfilling themselves in meaningful work, you know, differently, or have you found that kind of you can come out with kind of a general thing and everybody buys in and it's very similar? Um, I'm sure there's probably, you know, some smaller things that separate each individual from the next in terms of what their purpose is. But what 97, what our company has done in terms of like what our objectives are, you know, we're not, we're not for every company. I think everyone, when they come on at 97 floor, they know exactly what those are. So they have to at least buy into those ones or else why would you even want to work with us? Um, yeah. But yeah, there's probably little minor things that everyone has their own, you know, things that wake them up in the morning um, that might not be like a set, 97th floor um, so so help me all understand on your results oriented workplace so you got this thing where you're not it's not really nine to five eight to five it's not tracking time so much but you got to hit the results do you find that operating that way that a majority of employees go beyond the results they're supposed to achieve or they just hit the minimum that they're supposed to achieve and then they're taking off more time or how does that really work yeah, so we, that's actually a discussion. So that I think there's some cons to the way we do things. I don't think it's inherently a con because of the system, but it's kind of just a byproduct and we have to work extra hard to get, get away from that. It, so we used to be a very traditional, you know, clock in, half an hour lunch, like all, all that kind of stuff, just because that's all we knew from our past experiences uh, when we started the company. Um, I think one of the cons with Roe is people that are thinking a little more short term, they get their results and they're done. People that think long term, it doesn't matter that technically they could be done. Like it's, they don't have to sit in the chair until five o'clock to clock out. You know, they can be done at four or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. If you're thinking long term though, you're going above and beyond. You're trying to, you know, uh, do even more for your clients, you know, or, or take on, stuff maybe that's not client work but the company work because you're thinking more of like promotions and being able to take more responsibilities on long term we have that, that short term i think that is a a, a, a con of ours um of, of the kind of the system that we have in place um but at the end of the day i, I don't i think we used to think when we were i mean i know we're a small company at 96 uh people but when we, when we were like 10 15 20 people it was such a small knit group we had every it was like very entrepreneurial spirit, at least with, with everyone we hired. And now we're starting to get, you know, people where it, sometimes it's a little frustrating for me because I remember back in the day when all of the 15 people at the company were going above and beyond and doing stuff for 90 cent floor outside of their job description, where now we don't have that with everyone in the company. So it's a little frustrating for me. But then when I take a step back and think, well, what do I really care about? Like, do we care for every single employee to be as motivated and, you know, passionate about growing the company for the next 20 years as me? Like, no, I think as long as we have a, a core group that, that is doing that kind of stuff, then other people, it's like, well, 
we have a job that we want done and they do a phenomenal job at that and they don't want to really push anything more they're just kind of happy in, in that job then who are we to say that's that's wrong um so i think it's more my mentality that needs to kind of shift and not think that every single person is the same as me that kind of or others that kind of want to you know grow and be, have a little bit more entrepreneurial spirit yeah that's tough for people who are really driven to think that you know okay i'm done i'm clocking out you know type of thing but but from what you're saying you know it, it is logical you remove the emotion you know i'm willing to pay this amount of money for this to get done yeah and as long as they're doing that or a little bit above then i'm good and yeah. you know maybe i need to adjust it next year so they push themselves a little bit more type of thing whatever you can work it out so yes. just to wrap up so this has been very interesting been interesting on the marketing side and i really appreciate the perspective on the working with the millennials and also this this results oriented workplace what would be as it working coming from this results oriented workplace perspective which not a lot of our people are familiar with what would be the biggest piece of advice you would have for leaders out there to you know engage with your employees and and create a self motivating work environment because that's kind of the basis of this results oriented workplace isn't it you got to be self motivated with some guidelines otherwise it doesn't happen i mean what would you what would you give as a a closing piece of advice here. Oh man, there's there's a lot, but probably the first thing that comes uh, to mind is we've tried to really develop a, a culture where it's big. We always say like it's bigger than 90 some floor, and we really do believe that. Like we believe it's bigger than just business in general, right? Like I think we're a pretty family uh, centered organization, um, but just people. Like, like when we're all 90 years old, we're not going to remember this blend tech campaign we did, right? Like we're gonna remember the relationships we had with our clients, with our coworkers, and then just our, you know, personal lives, just who we are as human beings, right? And I know it, start, it starts sounding fluffy and whatnot like that, but I think if you can start off a little bit fluffy with, you know, one-on-ones or, I mean, we do, we're a smaller company, so like we can do our whole company meetings and talk about this kind of stuff and it, it doesn't get lost to, I don't think so. Um, we kind of start off that fluffy way that we actually really do care about you in that sense. And we care about ourselves and, you know, everyone here in that sense. So what can we, how can we leverage this company that we all decided to be a part of? We all chose to be here. How can we leverage that for the benefit of each of us? So that can be, you know, making this the best workplace so I can retire here and every single person here can retire. And this is their lifelong one, but if they want to go start their own company, or they want to go work in-house at a brand, you know, which we have a lot of ex-employees that are, you know, VPs of marketing at, you know, some pretty big companies and whatnot. Like, if we set that expectation from day one and we continually have that conversation throughout their employment and they understand, okay, 97th floor is here so for me to leverage it for my own benefit, but in doing so, I need to put my all into 97th floor so that is the best so that that leverage is the biggest leverage possible i think that creates a really cool dynamic and we're still in the early days um but we have uh, an alumni uh slack workspace so completely so anyone that's ever worked at 97th floor interns included they all you know some people don't decide but majority are on there so they're posting they're asking questions and tips and stuff posting jobs that they're hiring or they're looking for jobs and they're moving different states and then we do an annual um, alumni event. We just did a, I think a month and a half ago. Uh, again, we get a pretty good turnout, but not everyone that's ever worked there. But I think when you actually fulfill on that and it's, they're outside of the company, they went and started their own companies, they're working for other companies and 90 cent floor is still invested in them. Like that shows now new employees when they come in and see it. And I talk this fluffy stuff that we actually care about you and your life and 90 cent floor is here to serve you but the best way we can serve you is to have 90 cent floor be as strong as possible so that means you need to give your all and do really really good work it's no longer that fluffy stuff because they're seeing it play out and and we have like if you want to say case studies we're going to have case studies of people that were here and you know it wasn't they didn't want to be an agency for whatever but they they have all these options they have this great network on you know 90 cent floors alumni network and they've gone and gotten jobs and 
like every single time I'm seeing people that are going and working at different places because of this network that they had at 90 cent floor. And it all comes, it's like this whole vicious, vicious, healthy cycle um, where, you know, people see and they benefited from 90 cent floor helping them in their career. Well, guess who's, who they're going to hire if they do want to outsource to an agency, typically 90 cent floor. And we've had a lot of that, or they'll recommend us, you know, to other companies. And that makes us stronger and stronger and stronger. So we're hiring more people. And now it's, you know, more people that they can hire at their organization because they know that the standards that we, we have here at 90 cent floor in terms of education and um, work ethic and that, those type of things. So it's this, this beautiful, so that's kind of to sum it up is just um, help as many, if not at every person in your organization, like understand that you care about them as a person and not the day to day, but it's the day to day that allows for that big picture um, uh, benefits to come about in their yeah. lives. Yeah, interesting. And then you're basically building your own network. So I really appreciate you being with us, Wayne. I appreciate the insights you've given. This has been great. Uh, thanks to our audience. And, you know, I wish you the best moving forward with 97th floor. Maybe you guys can get up to the 100th floor one of these days. What do you think? One day. Yeah, one day. <laughs> Good, thanks. Thanks, David.